Hello, everyone. We'll be starting this presentation in just a couple of minutes at uh, 12.30. I'll just give a couple of minutes for everyone to join the room. My screen's still showing, isn't it? I just uh, moved it around. Yes, it is. Yep, yep. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, looks like people are still joining, but uh, since it's 12.30, I'll get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to uh, the University of San Francisco's MSDS series in data science seminar series. My name is Sean Butcher and I'm the partnership director for the Data Institute. Um, this seminar is brought to you by the University of San Francisco's Masters in Data Science program and sponsored by the Data Institute. Each year, we partner with companies and organizations around the San Francisco Bay Area and beyond to provide nine month internships for our students. During their degrees, our master's students spend 15 hours each week working at a company to tackle their data science and analytics problems. Uh, we're beginning to plan our internships this fall. So if you or your organization is interested in supporting the Data Institute or working with our students, please contact us by email at datainstitute at usfca.edu. Or alternatively, you can visit us on the web at www.usfca.edu slash data dash institute. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Wendy Wheeler. Wendy is a group manager um, for systems and data informatics engineering at BART, and her focus areas include digital transformation and data analytics. Today, she'll be talking with us about designing systems for adaptability and resilience in uncertain times. Uh, we'll leave time at the end of the talk for your questions. If you do have questions, please enter them using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, don't enter your questions in the chat section. Please enter them in the Q&A section. Welcome, Wendy. Uh, thank you. And I'm actually going to give a plug. We've actually worked with the USF students, not in the master's programs, but in the undergraduate. And we've gotten a lot of good work out of the uh, data science teams coming out of your um, college. And we look forward to continue working with you uh, next semester. So let me uh, share my presentation and make sure that you guys can see it. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. So um, just a little bit about the agenda. I'm gonna talk about BART's data and where we've come from, our high level digital transformation goals and our journey of how we got here the approaches that we're taking, um, both top down and bottom up approaches to our digital transformation and um, how we're utilizing tools like Splunk to do visualizations, lessons learned um, along the way, because I think that's very important to share those with people um, so that you don't actually hit the bumps that we've been hitting and you can prepare better for um, projects that you work on. And also um, elements of digital transformation that management has found 
you know, most appealing because if you can get managers to buy into your visions and that's how you get funding and that's how you move your agendas forward. So let's talk about where BART was a few years ago. <clears throat> we had a lot of data. On a good day, we get about 12.8 uh, million log messages. We have um, our control systems out in the field, um, also passenger information. And so we had all of this data kind of sitting um, in our operations control center, but not in a way that really helped all of the engineering and maintenance partners downstream. And also we had a lot of um, multiple customized systems that weren't really integrated together and to really have a really clean digital strategy, you really need to have systems integration. Uh, and we didn't have a consolidated digital channel um, so people could subscribe and get to the data that they needed. Um, that required us to have a lot of resources to pull data. We were designing individual feeds for people. It was very labor intensive. Uh, we wanted to move away from that. And, and so, you know, some of the things that we had, we have this huge opportunity at BART. We're a very old system. We have uh, technologies from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, um, but we had an opportunity with the large federal grants and with um, local grants and funding opportunities that we were able to, we are, have been able to upgrade a lot of our infrastructure. And with those types of projects comes the opportunities to grab on to moving our digital program forward. Um, and so we seized on that opportunity and I will talk a lot about that in this presentation. So some of our um, transformation, digital transformation goals, since we are spending all this money, uh, we wanna modernize and the technology that was out there in the early 70s and 80s really didn't communicate all of the information. But now as we're upgrading, there's computers built in, we have IoT devices, all this new stuff as we roll it out, we can actually connect it to the network and we can get really critical data out of it. So now where before, you know, you have the, you know, 14 million plus um, data points, right? We're getting even more data. But with that comes the challenge of how do you get the data to the right people? How do you do Wendy, your audio seems to have cut out. life safety system. So we wanted to move from that very reactive phase of our, you know, of our growth here to moving to a more proactive place. And you can do that with data analytics and with a clear digital transformation goal. With Wendy? that comes, yes. Um, your, we lost your slide presentation and your audio oh. cut out for about a minute. Did you get it back? Uh, yeah, uh, we can hear you now, but I don't can't see your presentation. Oh, okay, hold on. Give me one second. I will resolve that technical issue. Maybe, let's see. Share, Windows, slides. Okay, yes. can you see my slides, slides now? Yes, it's back again, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the heads up. Uh, so the other thing is, you know, our primary goal, we have two primary goals as a district, and one is to move you from point A to point B without delaying the movement that you have on the train. Our second goal is to do it safely. And so with that, those two initiatives of delivering you on time and safety, we wanted to focus our digital transformation goals um, and our digital funding to help improve both safety and reduce service delays. So when you actually go down this journey of kind of rethinking the way you do business, there's two real approaches, or actually three. You have the top-down approach, which is normally management-sponsored, you know, large funding, very strategic, normally operated out of the IT department. 
And then you have the other approach was your bottom up, which is very uh, grassroots and operational focused. And that's kind of, you know, we started there because the line people had problems. We've, also, we've often been very focused in this bottom up approach, but with all of this large capital funding coming in, we now have this hybrid approach at BART. And I'll talk more in this presentation, we'll talk more about that. So one of the management sponsored initiatives that really helped us move the needle was our migration of, to BART's, from BART's fixed block trend control system that we have today to our communication based trend control system called CBTC. This is a, gonna be a 10 year project plus, um, it's already underway. Uh, we're gonna be replacing the entire con train control system across the district, um, minus our extension out towards Antioch and Pittsburgh that is already on a, a system that's similar to that. Uh, we needed to do this in such a way where we provide a consolidated view because you can't switch out an entire train control system in, in one day, um, especially when you have to change out all the field equipment, you have to change out equipment on the trains themselves. So we actually have the challenge of running two systems together at the same time and making it seamless to the riders and seamless to all the back end infrastructure of all these various different systems that rely on the data that, that these train systems push out. And, and these train systems, I really consider them to be the heart of BART. They really are what we run our business from. And so as part of that, you cannot impact any of the downstream applications as you move forward. So how do you do that, right? And, I, and we're going to talk about our strategy. So we start off with what our current infrastructure looked like, right, which was our ICS, which is our integrated control system and that runs the actual trains, the people that actually drive the trains at BART don't drive the trains, they make sure passengers get on and on. Um, often unsuccessfully, if something happens in the trackway, they stop the trains, they can run and road manual if something happens. But really, we have this integrated control system that from a remote area um, manages the train movement with the help of the train control operators in that facility, that when the automated system, for some reason, we have train delays or things, those, those train controllers actually take over and manage. But the, the system is actually very, very sophisticated to keep the trains from moving from point A to point B. The system also res is responsible for our SCADA infrastructures, uh, and that runs everything, fire life safety, anything that you would see in a station, um, you know, the emergency overrides, um, elevator escalator alerts, um, you know, fans, fire alarms, you name it is, is run through our SCADA infrastructure. And all that data runs through ICS. Um, and so you take that system and now we're saying, we're gonna replace it with Hitachi's ATS system, but how do you run two very complex systems at the same time? So we had to take a step back and really think about how we can do this without impacting all the downstream applications and also not impact patrons with um, passenger movement and also not impact our control center that's used to running trains in a certain way. So our first step was we put Kafka in and we started uh, migrating all of our alerts, alarms and data into this Kafka infrastructure. And this is what your Googles, your Facebooks, everybody uses as kind of their back end to control their data. And we thought, why not BART, if we're gonna take this leap, why don't we use a technology that everybody else is using? It integrates with other systems. It's easy um, uh, to find people that know how to code and manage these types of infrastructures. And it allows us to leapfrog from very old legacy technology. Now we're cutting edge. And this also took a huge risk factor away from us because now we can feed the downstream applications from Kafka and also the Hitachi ATS system can ride over Kafka as well and feed the downstream applications. We can normalize the data, which is huge. And also it allows us to have a platform where we can allow communication between our old system and our new system and be able to run seamlessly from a train operator perspective. This migration um, also has lots of phases, right? So 
we're at a point right now, let me go back to the other slide. We're at phase as we're getting ready to go to what we call ATS first, where we are working with Hitachi to actually have them be able to control um, the plant from their system, not only the old, but new. So we're in testing on that right now. We had a major milestone uh, recently where they were actually able to simulate the controls. And we were so impressed with how easy it was for us to have that integration. Everybody thought that this integration would be the biggest risk to the project. And it turned out by using these standard technologies, we were able to cut time out of our schedules. Um, we're already ahead with our testing, our simulators are merged in with things. And it's it just, um, we made it seem easy by the technology decisions that we made early on in the project. So then after that ATS first, we're gonna start migrating track sections over and we're gonna be running, the people who actually run trains will be running out of um, Hitachi's ATS system and we'll be able to continue to run the plant through the entire migration and eventually eliminate the ICS train control system out of there and continue to run our plant SCADA infrastructure like the electrical traction power and all the fire life safety stuff will continue to flow into ICS, but we'll also feed into Kafka and we'll provide critical information since we do, you know, for example, run on electricity, the trains need to know the electricity is actually running, things like that, they get that information from Kafka. It simplified our development and allowed us to move forward. But the biggest thing that did for us is it provide us, provided us the foundation um, for our digital channel. And so, what does that mean to the district of BART? It means that now we have a single source of truth, which as any data scientist knows, this is one of the most critical things to have. Uh, it, it also decouples um, the migration so that it, it's easier for things to happen, right? And in addition to that, it allows us um, the foundation for rapid application development, either integration of tools that already Kafka supports because it's an industry standard. Um, and it also enables us to simplify people who want the data can actually subscribe to the, the district channel and they can develop their own stuff. They no longer need to come to my systems team to get data. And, and this frees my team up to do bigger projects that are at the district that we can move us forward in other areas. So it decreases my costs. It improves our ability to serve our patrons, increases our productivity, and just kind of moves us into a new way of doing business. And, and this is huge for us. Um, and, and, you know, I'm very, very proud of, of the team that I have that we were able to move this, move this forward with only a handful of developers. And, you know, everybody thinks you need an army of people to do these types of transitions, but really a, a small core group of very talented um, engineers can do these types of efforts now with the tools that are out in the industry. So, what are some of the challenges we face? Because I make it sound really simple and easy, but it, it, it really isn't in a lot of ways. And one of our biggest challenges that we're facing as we're adding more and more data to this new Kafka challenge or this new Kafka ch you know, channel or the district channel, who is the system, who regulates that data? You know, who governs it? And so we're getting to a point where now we've migrated our data. Now other people want to put stuff on the channel. And now we are setting up a governance team or we're working on that right now because we realize that if we don't have tight control over the data, it's going to become untrusted in the long run. Um, and so we, um, we are working on that challenge right now. And it's, you know, everybody feels their data should be the primary, you know, in this world and, and their data should be the way that things are seen. So, you know, there's a lot of negotiation that goes along in this type of area. One of the other challenges I did say that, you know, small teams are great, but as you, as more and more people want to join the channels and provide their data and integrate their data and utilize their data, you need a different set of people to handle the onslaught of requests because now that we have all this data, everybody wants a piece of it. 
And so you need more data scientists, you need more developers um, to do some of some of the integration work um, and migrate some of these back office systems to the new channels. So there's there is that lift as you're moving through. Um, you need different skill sets and different people, um, and you know, or cross training and training up uh, the staff that you have. Another area, I work in the operational technology area. Um, so I do anything in the wayside, you know, the substations, the trains and all of that. But I also have a partner group in IT that handles all of the back office um, systems. And a lot of that data, for example, the trouble ticketing systems, uh, your asset inventory system, you know, the financial system, all that stuff is done in, in the back end. And getting the funds to actually integrate those systems and, and the will for people to, you know, to do that with us, because they also have their own initiatives, has been, you know, something that we've been working on. And, and the funds that are required to do that, you know, we're in search of those as well. So, you know, none of this comes for free, even though the benefits are great. Um, and I'll show you later on why I would want to integrate with like a trouble ticketing system and a preventative maintenance system, uh, because, you know, with all that data and all of the production data, you really get a better picture of what's happening in your plant. Um, so these types of initiatives need to be funded and, and move forward. The other challenge is if you change out your entire back end infrastructure like we are um, you, we have to continue running trains. We have to manage the plant safely. So the whole, we have to ensure that all of this change doesn't impact production. Um, we don't want to, none of you want to get up in the morning and go, you know, you have to go to work and have us tell you that, sorry, you can't take the train today because we made a Kafka change, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, that is a challenge as you're, as you know, it's kind of like, the trains keep moving while we're doing all these system changes in the background. And we make it look effortless, um, but there is a lot of work that goes into that. And we're very fortunate that the train control systems and all these back end things are non vital. The actual train itself can protect itself. If we do something wrong, it'll stop trains so they don't run into each other. But we don't want to get to a point where the trains don't move. So we do put a lot of effort in this space, but that is definitely a challenge and a concern or risk area that we think about every single day. The last thing is there is, I call it a shortage of system engineering perspective. We have at BART engineering disciplines from traction power, mechanical engineering, um, civil engineering, all of these disciplines are designing projects, but they, don't necessarily have systems expertise or don't think like from the systems perspective. So if you're you're implementing a new substation, for example, they may not think about, oh, I need to connect it to the network. I need to think about the new alerts that are going to come out of this brand new system I've never seen. And what's going to be important to the maintenance team? What's going to be important to me is that engineering team that's responsible for that asset. And what we have found in this journey that we've had is that there are very few engineers that can think big picture from a data perspective and from a project perspective to be able to translate the needs for those assets into actionable data to push back out. And so we've been working with various different people in the district to you know, educate them on this type of systems engineering um, work and picking their brains to get all of the critical data. Because even though I have computer systems engineers and mechanical engineers and electrical engineers on my team, they aren't as familiar with the end assets as the asset owner themselves. And also, since all of our technology is being upgraded across the system from the train control to power to lighting to you name it, everything's being swapped out. There's no way that a small development team like mine can keep up with that amount of change. So we really have to work with our peer partners um, to move the needle in this space. And, and with that, they have to take time out of their very busy schedules to educate us. And as you know, you know, taking time to do something that may not be as critical for you is, is often a challenge, but we've been able to show people the benefits of data and the benefits of the channels 
the digital channels and the benefits of us moving our digital transformation forward. And as we've done that, we have, we've acquired what I call advocates for the projects in the various disciplines. And I strongly recommend anyone who works in this field, partner, partner, partner with people, because as smart as we all are, we are not as smart individually as we are as a community of very talented engineers, right? Um, so that is a skill set of that partnership and working with people's skill set is something that every data scientist needs to learn. So I talked about there are two different approaches to digital transformation. One is this um, top-down approach, and I only gave the example, a couple of examples of the uh, projects from the top-down perspective that were funded. The other way that change happens is this grassroots initiative projects. We were um, very fortunate, or I was very fortunate, that the IT department brought in Splunk to do some security work. And, you know, I made a snippy comment, you know, why does IT get all the cool pro uh, products, right? Why don't I get stuff like this, right? Why don't I get money to buy cool things? And they said, well, you can use our Splunk instance and you guys can start, you know, creating dashboards and do whatever you want. Here's Here are the keys to the kingdom, go at it. And that really was a game changer because we have all this data and now with Splunk, we have a way to create dashboards and visualizations within Splunk um, that have helped move the needle on providing views to you know, our maintenance and engineering staff that they never had in the past. And I'll talk more about that later. We also um, had an opportunity now that we have all this data to create what I call maintenance network operations center, these little mini um, knocks. And that allowed data to get to the people that actually needed the data. And that wasn't the case before. We had centralized the data um, and they really relied on other people to give them information or relied on my team to tell them things or our operational control center to tell them things. Um, so by creating um, places where they could view data um, and, and has been very, very helpful. Uh, we also have um, public weather stations that we've implemented and private weather stations and also IoT devices in the infrastructure to gather even more data that we needed critically. So these were some of the grassroots initiatives that help have been helping us. So, you know, if you don't know what Splunk is, I thought I would quickly just bring up a slide. Um, Splunk is a collector and indexer of data, takes in large volumes of data from a diverse, um, from diverse feeds, from IoT devices to things like we have log files from network components, you name it, anything that you want to, if you have large volumes of data, you can pump it in here and easily um, create um, usable content for end users. So as part of this journey, we, we have a lot of troubleshooters, right? And these are highly paid people that know how the plant works. And, and Jeff is one of my, um, one of my senior uh, troubleshooters. Incredible amount of knowledge in a person's brain, right? That, that troubleshooting skill set, you don't, not everyone is born with that. And, and so how do you take knowledge that is in a person like Jeff's brain, right? And translate it into all, to the Kafka, into Splunk, into dashboards and, and make it so that we can shift um, the data from this high cost engineering resource to a lower cost resource who actually needs that data to do their job, right? And, and this is how we're thinking as an organization. Now that we have, uh, we have all of this data in a way that we can now do that, we are now in the process of taking um, the various scenarios that we have and creating algorithms and, and common troubleshooting techniques and procedures so that um, people that may not be as skilled in that higher end troubleshooting, um, giving them the nuggets that they need to um, do their work. And with that, by putting it in the actual hands of the maintenance staff and the engineering staff that are responsible for those assets, not the systems team, but the actual people that repair it, you reduce the troubleshooting time. I don't have to wake, 
wake up my troubleshooter in the middle of the night to join a call to troubleshoot something. They actually have the data that they need. They know what parts they need to take out. They can go out and do those things. Um, it reduces our costs. It reduces our postmortem costs because we know exactly the logs and the information that people have, right? We can tell what happened easily and faster. We don't have to spend a lot of time and money doing postmortems. Um, and, and also it improves our metrics reporting, right? We, we have to report out to our board every month. And so through the use of data, we can actually take this troubleshooter and, and actually, um, actually uh, improve our processes and save money. I mean, at a time like this, where we are running way below capacity and our operating budgets are way down, we have to do more work like this in order for us to keep our costs as a district down. So let's talk about some of the things we started with in the beginning with Splunk. You know, train, we move trains. So um, this is only one little tiny piece of our train control dashboard. It's one of the most important, it's called false occupancies. This is when you think a train is in a track circuit, but it really isn't. And so we need to know that, that what the reasons are and we dispatch people out in the field. Now the actual train control team can see their own dashboard. They know where they're having problems. Even before the train control operations center calls them to say, look, I've, I had a false occupancy. Can you have someone go look at it? They're already, they're already on the radio saying, oh, we just had an incident. Go out and look at these things. And that's a change for us. Before we waited for operations to call us and the maintenance teams would then go out. Now we're providing them with the data at their fingertips so they can dispatch people. And by doing that, we reduce the delays that we have for our patrons. And for all of you on the phone, that's a good thing if you take part. The other thing, if we go to the next dashboard that was a game changer for us is you have two, in, in organizations, you have lots of different areas of um, expertise and they all will tell you it's not my problem. You will hear that a lot, not my problem. And so the network, and this is an example of a not my problem incident. Well, we have the network group and the train control group. And there was lots of finger pointing between the two organizations you know, not my problem. I went out and looked at my equipment. Well, we said, okay, why don't we create a dashboard that has both of your views in one place and we can correlate the data that says, okay, if you're having a train control issue of the HLC, train control issue, are you having any network alerts at the same time? And it was interesting because when we tried to solve this problem, our train control network is completely isolated, but the VHLCs actually have a way to tell us that they are communicating. And so by this, now people no longer have to finger point, they go to this dashboard and we can tell immediately if we're having a problem either with the VHLC or, or with the network. And so why is that important? Because finger pointing takes time <laughs> and we don't have time. And so by having information at people's fingertips to be able to determine who needs to solve the problem, things get done faster, right? Another not my problem um, type of scenario, uh, our trains are run on traction power. And so we have a part, part of that is when you do high voltage, you have grounding issues and grounding electricity um, is not good for components in the field if it's not grounded properly and that causes false occupancies for trains. And so we were able to build this dashboard to see if we had any grounding issues that may correlate with um, train control issues. So this is another example of partnering data from two different disciplines and combining it in such a way that helps the end users solve things faster, better, cheaper. This next thing is predictive maintenance. So yeah, it's great to be able to show alarms of things after they happen, which those last two scenarios showed you, which is, you know, I'm still in reactive mode, right? We know an incident happened. I just need to figure out what I need to fix. When you shift now into trying to create algorithms to prevent outages. So we took a very close look at our traction power 1KB DC circuit breakers 
every night we shut down our entire traction power grid. And it's a huge, it's a, we basically run a giant power plant. Um, we have substations and track uh, and electrical um, along our entire trackway. So we shut everything down for safety reasons because we do maintenance at night. When we come out of the blanket, we call it the blanket, we come out of the blanket after we do maintenance and we re-energize our plant. We noticed through the data that if a circuit breaker had two or more circuits closed within a 15 minute period, that that could lead to fires, explosions and things like that. So now we have this algorithm, we come out and nothing has caught on fire yet, but now we have, in this case, four breakers that could potentially have issues. In the past, and we still do this, we do preventative maintenance, right? We go out and we check the circuits, circuit breakers, we run preventative maintenance procedures on them. But you know, if I have thousands of these things that I have to maintain, right? I start at the beginning and I go to the end. Well, what happens in between cycle that could cause a, cat a catastrophe, this is how they know about it today. And this is a recent development for us. This has come into play in, in the last five months, five or six months. Um, so we now have this, um, these alerts, they can drill down into this number four, you can see the types of problems that you're having and you immediately dispatch your maintenance crews to those locations to then provide to either do the PM or to check the breakers to see if they see any visual indications that things are going wrong. And this is, remember when I, when I said, what are our primary goals? I wanted to move us from what I would call very reactive, which is, you know, preventative maintenance stuff, just um, moving from alarms to creating algorithms like this where we can prevent catastrophic disasters. So another area um, with electricity that we are focused on, I don't know if you guys know PSPS, PG&E shuts down power. It's very important for us to know um, that our UPSs are functioning properly. And as part of all of this top-down money that has come to us, we are replacing a lot of our UPS or adding UPS, uh, UPSs um, out into the field so that if we lose commercial power, we're able to keep our stations operational. So um, you can see from this dashboard, we can tell that two of our stations, the UPSs are not indicating, which means I'm not getting any information from them. And so we need to get people to go out there and look at that. And, and we, in the past, never had a way to know that things were not indicating um, properly because things weren't connected to the network. The older technologies were not smart enough to have those types of connections. So now we know that things are broken. And we also know we have four alerts on each of the, at each of these stations. So now I can dispatch a maintenance person to go look at these particular issues. Um, this is helpful for us because I don't want you during a power outage to be standing at a station in the middle of the night and not have power. Um, and you're somehow having to get out of a station with no, you know, get out of a station with the station not being able to, I mean, we of course open gates and we have emergency lighting, but you really want a patron to have the experience that the full station is up and operational and you want to be able to get out. Um, and, and we all, you know, we can move power around the district in the trackway to keep tracks running, but the UPS is really what keeps the stations, um, the station lighting and all of the, the stuff that's running at the stations functioning. And if we don't have power at the station, then we're required to um, shut that station down. So this is a really, uh, really a cool thing for us to be able to monitor this infrastructure more effectively. In addition to that, uh, we have line fans for um, moving fire, uh, if we have a fire to move um, smoke out of our, our tunnels, out of our stations. And so this is a really important thing when I said in the beginning, a goal to improve the safety and, and reduce our risks in this space. We now have the ability to consolidate for our engineering and maintenance teams areas that we may have more problems with our um, fans. And then we go in and we actually bring in consultants to look at the infrastructure or we have our mechanical and maintenance teams go out there and, and look at the issues and make sure that things are running properly. Um, and you know we can now tell 
Um, we can now tell that in one place. And it's not the difference between this and how things were run in the past is we didn't have this view of I couldn't go back in time and, and look um, in an easy way without a engineer, a systems engineer gathering data for me. Now the end user can change the timeframes, look at their data, run reporting, drill down into things, look at their own data. I don't need to be involved anymore. The only time I need to be involved is if they want to see their data in a different way. Um, so this is now a huge research tool for our mechanical engineering so that they, they can redesign the system, fan systems that are out there. If they're not properly, if they're getting too old or they're not functioning correctly, they can redesign them or that we see that we have uh, maintenance trends and maybe we need to do more frequent um, maintenance procedures on those particular fans. So it now provides us to uh, reallocate resources in a more efficient way. So when you do things well in a data analytics way, people will ask you, why didn't you catch this? And this is a prime example of where I was questioned, you have all this data, why did our track flood? Um, so in December, we had a heavy rain and the sump pumps, of course, I said, we got 180 alarms. We saw the data. But what we found, you know, just because you see data doesn't mean that you have the right algorithms in place. Because I said, I saw the data. Why didn't you guys do something? Not my problem, right? <laughs> this is kind of my, was, but then I thought about it a little bit and I said, you know, maybe I need to go talk to a mechanical engineer because I really don't know a lot about sump pumps, except for this one pumped out a lot of alerts. And what we noticed is that sump pump, the alerts cleared within seconds. So when the person that manages those devices said, oh, it fits, it's not an issue, the water's cleared, everything is fine. But when I talked to the mechanical engineer, the mechanical engineer told me, Wendy, that's not normal for a sump pump to clear in a second. Normally a, a sump pump will run, clear all the water out, and then it will go off for a period of time. So you shouldn't see these short, short bursts of alerts like you're seeing. And I said, well, okay, if that's the case, what would you, what would be not normal? So he basically said, if you get more than 10 high sump pump alerts in a 24 hour period, you need to get somebody out there. So we created the algorithms in, in Splunk and we created these alerts that go out via email and on their dashboards. And lo and behold, in January through March, we had three major rainstorms we started getting these flooding alerts and like we, we programmed them for. And what we found was absolutely amazing. We were able to catch circuit breakers, turning off sump pumps. We found damaged wires. Um, we had garbage in the sump pumps, bad controllers, you name it. We had all sorts of problem areas that we were able to get to before the um, for the the um, trackway flooded that you know what does that do for a patron if the track doesn't flood we can move trains through it right and so we were able to through these alarms and all of the rain we had so far in 2021 we have not had any flooding in the trackway in addition to that we have had no flooding in um, areas because um, we were really focusing on the trackway because that's, we're all focused on moving trains. But what we also found is we weren't having flooding in areas like the Coliseum BART station where the, um, the uh, parking structure, there's a walkway underneath that would flood, right? And the parking lot would flood. And this is the first year actually that we've been able to get through a rainy season without the Coliseum flooding and without actually any track flooding. Um, so that actually improves the patron experience. And you as a patron would never see this, right? But from a back end, you know, a lot of this work happens. The other thing that this historical sump pump data did for us is we could provide dashboards to the mechanical engineering team to highlight where we might have potential issues. And as you see from here, one of the stations had excessive alerts. And, and that was annoying. It was like constant noise to our operations center and to the maintenance folks. But the engineering team didn't realize how bad, because, you know, I think 
and this is something everybody should realize, is if you um, if you are if you work with a bunch of noise, you get used to noise. But when the engineering team saw this, they realized that they needed to deal with it. So there are areas that we don't have technology. So we've added wire sensors and we're piloting um, water sensors. We're piloting those. In addition to that, um, heat is a major problem with train delays. Um, heat waves cause problems. It's also, it was very labor intensive for us. So one of the things that we've done in the last year, um, this is an old slide. We have a lot more of these sensors in the field. We deployed IOT devices with temperature sensors and we were able to detect heat. And why is heat important? We get um, rail issues from heat, our train control rooms overheat and we have um, train control failures due to hardware. Um, so we were able to create not only alerts through emails, but also these dashboards and this pilot of 15 um, sensors, when we ran through those heat waves last year, we were able to prevent everywhere where we had a sensor, we had no train delays. This was the first time ever during a major heat wave that we were able to predict where the failures were. Prior to this, we used to have maintenance crews drive around to every station with a temperature gun testing how hot it was in the room. And let me tell you, you are always not at the room you need to be in before it causes a problem. Well, what happens when you're successful with a pilot? You start to deploy more sensors and all of a sudden your graphs and your visuals become, I call, unusable. I am now called the weather lady. Well, it's hard for the weather lady to look at this and figure out what the heck's going on or where should I even focus? Um, and we're deploying more and more of these sensors out into our environment, which is, you know, it's great and glad it was successful, but now we need to think about how do we visualize the data more, more effectively. I was very fortunate. I had um, students from Cal Berkeley last year that were able to um, integrate with weather stations um, out in the world so that we know when we're having weather conditions. And this summer I have two interns um, that just came on board and they have um, take, taken that project that UC Berkeley did and have now created a visual that we can now consolidate all sorts of information into a very user-friendly interface. And this, they're still not done with the project, but this is just a snapshot. We have a bunch of fake data. So of course you're not gonna have hot, cold rain and everything all at once. We're not, you know, we don't have, we have diverse climates here in the Bay Area, but not this diverse. Um, and this allows us when you get one of these alerts, you can drill down in it and you can see what type of alerts and what type of activity. And so this is gonna be a consolidated view for our maintenance team to know where they should focus their time. And this is much easier to look at being the weather lady. I can tell you this is much easier than looking at this. And, and also with this, I can now not only tell heat, which is all I can tell from here, I can now tell how much precipitation I can, um, we're gonna be able to put forecast data in here huge win for me as the weather lady and also a huge win for operation centers for our maintenance staff so that they know where to fo focus resources and know where they have problems to fix and do maintenance. And I keep talking about this operation center. This picture is of our operation center. This is where we get all of the alerts 24 hours a day. This is where we run trains and traction power. Um, all of our communication out into the field, you know, the woman that come or the people that come over the PA telling you step back from the yellow line, all of that comes either from here or the station agents in the field can also do communication messages, but they handle all the incident handling for the plant and the field alerts. And these people are great, but there's only a handful of them. And there's a lot, as I said, a lot of alerts coming in. So one of the things we did, as I said earlier, we um, created these network operations centers for power, mechanical, computer, train control, and also maintenance. And now we have big screens and dashboards in their locations where they can start looking at their own data and not relying on the operations center to contact them. That's a huge shift because before we didn't have the technologies to allow them to just parse out their data. And now we do, and now we're empowering them with their data. What does that do for us? It reduces service delays, cuts our, our costs down significantly for both maintenance and our operations center. 
incidences are handled more efficiently. And, you know, we, as a manager and as a management team, we now have more visibility than ever into our plant. Not that we have everything coded and, you know, things, we're still developing this. We're new, we're, we're just learning the touch of the iceberg of what's possible to do in these environments. And now that more and more people are learning about how powerful data is, more and more people are requesting more things to be in the dashboards um, and more visualizations which is a great problem to have because now people want to see their data. And we're now moving from, we're now moving into a data-driven approach to running our business. And, and that's as data scientists where we need to show people and guide people um, in this space. Some of the challenges that we've had with our network operation centers now you have, so before we had engineering team, my engineering systems engineering team who understands all this data because we programmed it, we, we know what it is, it moves and we may not understand everything about the data, but now we're moving it to maintenance people who may not understand what they're looking at at these visual in these visualizations or maybe what seems logical to us in the views is really confusing to people that have never ever thought of things in the data. Before they used to get a ticket that said, Go to go to Rockbridge Station and fix the ventilation or fix the air, air conditioning there or fix the train control equipment. They were told in the ticket what to do. Now we said, you know, we want you to look at the data and open up your own tickets and you do your dispatching. Um, and so we're we're growing in this space to get people, the floor workers and the people educated, um, a lot of training and also a lot of trusting in the data you have to have a lot of successes before people really believe that the data is accurate. And the second you have bad data, it starts to erode people's ability to rely on it. So that is something that if you, the one thing you have to focus on is trusting data. Um, I wanna talk about a quick second on what management found appealing because all of you out there, if you ever do projects, you have to get management to fund things. For us, service delays is the number one priority of the district is to get people safely places and also you know, on time. And through the data um, digital transformation and our data projects, we've been able to reduce service delays. We've been able to be predictive so they're not asking us, why didn't you know this was gonna happen? We're telling them, by the way, this is broken. People are already en route before, before people are impacted. They, they, management has been incredibly happy with that. We've been able to do more root cause analysis um, and you know, also providing them visibility. They no longer have to call somebody. They can pull up their dashboards themselves. I have a manager that actually has his own knock at his home he runs the, one of the maintenance, he's the head of the maintenance team and he has his home, home not so 24 by seven, he has that visibility. It's a game changer for him. He can call and say, why haven't you gone out there and looked at this alert? And, and before he didn't have that, he had to rely on you know people and then he would go back and ask people why things took so long. Now he can actually facilitate getting things done. Um, people like the fact that we've disseminated the work closer to the people that are doing it. Um, we've reduced costs and, you know, the fact that we're changing the culture um, to be more data driven has been a very big selling point. Some lessons learned. This is not easy. This is not easy work. Um, systems integration is hard. Um, we have some conflicts between our IT versus OT groups. And, and we really need to partner and, and fund those initiatives so that we can do things jointly. Uh, user knowledge, which as I said before, um, and also um, initiatives need to be put in place to put processes in place to handle all of these changes. You just don't plop technology in and you think that the process magically mushroom. If you don't take the steps to put those processes in place to use all this fabulous data, you will fail. Um, as an organization. And so we are constantly trying to um, move the needle on our processes. This is kind of a weak area for us um, at this point because you know we're really good at pumping out dashboards and doing stuff, but to catch up with the processes has definitely been a difficult challenge. And I often, people don't think about cultural shifts. People don't like change. 
I've been doing it this way for 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, you know, as long as I've been a bird, I've always done it this way and it works. Getting people to change their mindset takes effort. It takes people in the data science field. You have to keep showing people, you have to prove people, you have to work with them, you have to partner with them. And, you know, slowly people come around and now people ask you, right? But you have to change their minds to move forward. Um, this digital adaption, you have to have people that are championing it, like that manager who has that knock in his home. He is one of my biggest advocates. You need to find champions for projects. You need to train staff. You need to, you know, have people believe in data and you have to find the experts in these organizations who are willing to work for you. So those are some of the lessons that we learned along the way, because, you know, that and then also there's a lot of competing projects and priorities and you have to get yours raised up in the organization and you have to get other people to realize you're a priority. Um, and that's on any data project you're going to work on. You need to do that and getting money for those projects. And the last thing I want to mention is I love IoT devices, they're fabulous, but we do, we tested like, for example, a weather sensor, a heat sensor, and guess what? It phoned home to China. <laughs> you know, you gotta be very careful when you deploy IoT devices in your infrastructure, knowing how they're gonna behave, setting up the security, and to be able to, to detect when things are going wrong um, so that you don't cause more catastrophe by instrumenting, right? So digital transformation is a mindset. You have to move people and get people to think about it. And, you know, all of us, as we've grown, right, we now rely on our cell phones. We have cars that talk to us. Every one of us in our day-to-day -day lives are part of this digital transformation as a society. And we translate that into our businesses. So at that, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, we will leave a few minutes for questions. Um, if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A uh, box at the, uh, the bottom of the screen. Uh, we do have one question. Um, it's actually one of the things I was wondering about. You mentioned you had backup generators or UPS. Yes. What, what, is that, what exactly does that look like for a system like BART? That diesel <laughs> generators, <laughs> massive battery farms, what, what is it? Right, so that's a really good question. So we have giant diesel UPSs. When we have something like a PSPS with um, PG&E where they're shutting off power, we have to drive diesel trucks around all these facilities to fill them, right? So when we have mm -hmm. these major fires, you will you will see generators parked out in front of stations, connecting to the stations, or we have the generators there, but you have to fuel them, right? So there's an elaborate logistics team in the background that does all of that work. Um, it's, it's a major initiative, actually. Uh, we had another question about um, where do you, do you host your own servers or are you using uh, cloud servers or something like Amazon or Google Cloud? So we, because we are very um, security conscious, we do almost all of our OT technology on-prem. I'm doing cloud-based for our IoT devices. Um, and I'm funneling them through multiple firewalls because I, I don't trust them. I, I don't put anything I don't trust necessarily onto my OT environment. So we do a little bit of cloud, but very, mm -hmm. very little. Yeah, I was um, interested when you were talking about the Hitachi having a simulator. Um, one of the kind of interesting aspects of uh, the systems you're working on is how do you push changes to the system? It's not like a, a typical software environment where you may, you'll have a testing environment or where the changes are not critical. But you know, with the stuff you're doing, obviously, it can have, uh, you know, it can be literally critical um, if you push something out that doesn't go well. So, so what kinds of approaches do you um, uh, take to ameliorate the kind of risks involved in pushing changes? Yeah. So we. So we have a lot of different systems that get changed for train control, for example. Um, we, in our integrated control to ICS system, we have simulators that we have. We do releases about every six weeks. 
Uh, we simulate those environments. Um, we put out release notes. Um, and we also, when we go live, we actually monitor how those changes go in in the production field as well. So we simulate it. But as you know, with simulation, it may not be 100%. And that train control system, the other thing that makes sleep at night is that the vital system itself is not part of my system right. so and there's a lot of regulations around the vital system and so when we um do, do any changes on vital we actually do field testing we run trains without people in them mm -hmm. there's a lot of extra safety precautions in that space um, we also in the SCADA environments we simulate um, all the changes in our labs because you can do that with skated, what type of alerts are coming out and all the sequencing for like fans. Um, you would think that, oh, turning on a fan is easy. It's not easy. We need to have doors closed. We need to have fans moving. You know, they need to be in a certain sequence. So we need to know that all the sequencing is working. So we have scenarios there and we actually do field testing for those as well um, in off revenue hours, things like that to make it safer. Excellent. Um... Are there any types of groups or standards related to the work you're doing? I mean, uh, is there any ability to cooperate with other transit systems or, you know, any kind of standards or groups where you can share ideas or share technologies? Yes. So we have something called Iceberg and Comed. And those are a consortium of um, train operators from around the world. We share information in those groups. Um, they do studies for us um, and gather information from all, you know, for example, I just sent out a request because we're um, implementing new fare gates. I send out my fare gate questions. They provide me feedback about their fare gates or with the digital data stuff, they Comed and Iceberg have done, Comed has done studies, or is it Iceberg? Well, both of them have done studies for digital transformation and shows where each agency is in our transformation journey right mm -hmm. um, because you know that and they it's interesting in those um in those forums it shows us how we've progressed right and it right. shows us the frameworks that people are using and we went from a chaotic mess in the early 2000s and now there's frameworks and approaches that agencies are taking and it provides us the opportunities to see how we can leapfrog each other right because we learn from each other's successes right uh, we have a question from paul um about, are you, are you using machine learning at all in, in any of your systems? Um, we are working with UC Berkeley and hopefully with you guys in the fall, if anybody takes our projects to do more machine learning. Um, we really want to move the needle on that. Um, we've just been plugging holes up to this point, but um, we have an intern this summer that's done, we have a, some complicated problems that we've had in the district that haven't been able to be solved. And we had an aerospace engineer that joined the team and, and she looked and used machine learning tools. And I can't off the top of my head remember which tools she's learning using right now. Um, but she was able to solve the problem that's been plaguing us for, uh, I want to say forever. It seems like a long time. Um, but now that she's pinpointed it, I mean, that, that kind of stuff we need to do more of. And, and that's kind of where we want to head over the next couple of years. Right. You mentioned uh, security, particularly with kind of IoT devices. Um, mm -hmm. What I mean, what kind of processes and procedures do you have in place for security? There's obviously been a lot of uh, news coverage about you know, like uh, oil pipelines being taken down, and right. I'd assume that you know public transport systems would be a, a primary target of cyber criminals. So, um, do you you know what what kind of focus and approach do you take to that? So one, we've invested a lot of money in cyber tools, and that has really been great for us. Um, you know, we were able to get some federal money for that, and and that actually helps me sleep at night knowing that we have have tools that we can detect cyber issues. Um, as we bring in, for example, IoT devices, we'll look out and research. You know. Um, on, on the net, if anyone's had any problems with these types of things, we bring them into our labs, we research things there. Um, and then also we detect problems, you know, in the field too, with our, our um, security monitoring tools. If something that we didn't catch in the lab gets us with an IoT device, we immediately know it and we can shut those things down. And, and um, you know, we always do pilots, right? And so we run things for a period of time um, and then figure out if we have any issues with those IoT devices. 
you know, either technical issues, cyber issues, whatever, right, before we do a mass rollout, we can pull those devices out right away and, and put something, some new technologies in. And we've got team, teams of people that research that type. We have a, a specialized team that researches those types of technologies. Excellent. Uh, we had one question about what would be the, is there a good way to reach you? Uh, somebody had a question about, um, you know, picking your brain about uh, the approach you've taken to um, this transformation process in, in, in other, other, in other fields. Um, is there, uh, is absolutely. There a good way to reach you? Um, yes. My email is w, uh, w, or W-W-H-E-E-L-E, not, no R for some reason, at BART.gov. Um, and um, I can always be reached by that. I'll put that email in the chat as well. And that is the best way to reach me. And I'm also available on LinkedIn. I'm a little slower on LinkedIn, <laughs> but because uh, I'm really busy, but I, I am always willing to share information. Okay. Well, I think we're just about out of time. So I uh, want to thank you very much, Wendy, for um, coming and speaking with us. Um, I've learned a lot more about BART and I can appreciate some of the things that are going on behind the scenes when I'm, I'm sitting on some of your trains. So uh, when, I, when I'm delayed, I, I'll be a little bit more patient next time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to your students. I mean, there's so much more information and so much more stuff we're doing in this space. So I'm really glad I was able to share with you guys today. Thank you so much. And thank you to the members of our audience. I look forward to seeing some of you in our future seminars. Thank you so much. Good afternoon.